we're going to be taking a break from our Ephesians series and spending this week and next week in Romans chapter 6, the first 14 verses, uh, and looking at um, death and resurrection. These are the bookends, bookend Sundays of Holy Week, and so we're going to focus on death this week and resurrection next week. And so to do that, take your Bibles and locate Romans chapter 6, would you? While you're finding Romans 6, I suspect most people in this room would have heard of the phrase, wanted, dead, or alive. Maybe if you're really young, maybe not, but more than likely, your your mind right now is thinking of a Western movie. Maybe you're picturing some tumbleweed going across a desert, you know, uh, pathway. Maybe you see an old saloon or something like that, right? You're thinking wanted, dead or alive. In God's economy, that's not true. In God's economy, in the family of God, in his kingdom, it's wanted, dead, and alive. Let me see if I can explain it to you. God desires that his children be both dead to sin and alive to God, not or. And this is exactly what Romans 6 lays out for us. How to live a dead and alive life. And I want to focus this week on the phrase dead to sin and next week on the phrase alive to God. So to do so, let's look at Romans 6. Can we? Verses 1 to 14. Follow along with me as I read, and we'll see how this phrase will take shape, give us meaning, and we'll see what God would say to us about this. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Say the next three words with me, church. By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Notice verse 11, a key verse. So you also must consider yourselves, say it church with me, next three words, dead to sin and, say it church, alive to God in Christ Jesus. There it is, dead and alive. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Well, let's tackle this first aspect, can we? This idea of being dead to sin. We'll tackle alive to God next week. So let's talk about what this phrase actually means first. Then I want to discuss as we close why it matters. So what does it actually mean? Well, you'll notice that in this section of verses, the times that it's mentioned uh, precisely, there are two of them. And they're all in the past tense. Verse 2 and verse 11. You see in your Bibles there? We who died to sin. Verse 11. Consider yourselves dead to sin. Some of you are thinking, I don't feel that way. I feel like sin's really alive in my body, in my life. (laughs) He's speaking here past tense of something that occurred to you. And I think he's speaking here of sin's penalty, that if you're in Christ, 
You are no longer under the penalty or condemnation of sin. It died the moment you believed because of Christ. There's also a present tense pointing to the idea of death to sin in verses 13 and 14, 12 and 13. In the last part where he says, do not let sin reign in your body and do not present your members to sin. So the idea here is of something in the present tense. Like we know that you are dead to sin, but don't let it keep reigning in the present tense. And so I kind of see these, these two opposite poles, we'll call them. Something happened to sin in the past because of Christ and something happened to sin in the present because of Christ and they relate to us. Notice the pronouns here. They're relating to us. So these first initial observations of being dead to sin, they're regarding us and our pronouns. So we've died to sin in the past and we are dead to sin in the present in some way, in some regard. We're not to yield our members. We're not to um, be under its control. So, so what, are, what are these pronouns and these, these four mentions say to us about what it means to be dead to sin? Essentially, it just simply means that Living as one dead to sin means living as one who is not under the guilt and guidance of sin. It can't condemn us and it doesn't control us. It does not mean that at times it doesn't snap at us, trip us, yes. But the sense of, of verse one, shall we continue in sin? Is that of habitual persisting patterns and habits? And the text is quite clear, both in its past and in its present. Sin, for those in Christ, sin has no guilt and no guidance. It doesn't condemn and it doesn't control. That's essentially what it means to be dead to sin. Now, the question in your mind is, how in the world is that to happen? Because that sounds too good to be true. It almost sounds impossible. Well, let me share with you, apart from Christ, it actually is. It is impossible. And that's why I love the middle part of this section of this section of scripture, because while we see pronouns that refer to us at the beginning and the end, both past and present, what is absorbed in the middle, what takes the main focus of the section is all the pronouns and the phrases that refer to Christ's death to sin. There are at least five. Circle these in your Bible, would you? Look at verse three baptized into his death. Verse five, united with him in a death like his. Verse six, our old self was crucified with him. Verse eight, we died with Christ. Verse 10, he died to sin. I love the fact that, that in between our past and present, so to speak, is the, the bulk of this text describing Christ's death to sin. And so what Paul is connecting is Christ's death to sin and our death to sin. He's showing the relationship between the two. And it's this, we can only have ours because he had his. Christ's death to sin is the link to our own death to sin. To say it another way, our death is in his death. And if you want to see a picture of moralism, you just take out the middle section and you try to find a way to cover your sin of the past and free yourself from its guilt and try to live as sinless as possible in the present and it will crush you. All of that effort, all of those works are to no avail if the middle part of this chart is missing because we have no power to free ourselves from sin's guilt or its guidance if it weren't for Christ. And this is so grammatically, linguistically, just laid out for us. In fact, let me just throw some more words to you. If you were to look at the past, you would, you would see that all of Christ's work sources, it feeds, it empowers our justification. In fact, this is the word used, I think it's verse seven where it says, we have been freed from sin. That's the word justification. They could have easily said, the translators could have easily said, uh, we've been justified by Christ's death. So we know that Christ's death to sin justifies us. 
We also know that it sanctifies us. This is the idea of the present sin, sin not controlling us currently, not uh, us not presenting our members to sin, but instead presenting, presenting them to God. All of that's empowered by the cross of Christ. So our justification, our sanctification, our past, our present, word it however you want. All of your life is tethered to and hinged to the death of Christ on the cross. Now, more specifically as to how this is experienced, I want you to circle three verbs in your Bible, would you? It's the word no. It's quite interesting. It's used three times. There are also in this section four questions. I think most of them are rhetorical. And so in combination with the three uses of the word no, Paul, I think, is saying, guys, get this in your head. Lock this down in your memory. Know this. Stand on this. Let this be a concrete, theological, spiritual reality and fact. In fact, I would even say that he, go, he goes beyond the word no, and he, he uses a number of verbs here, I think, to escalate the issue. Let me walk you through these real briefly. He uses the word no three times, saying this is where it begins. Knowing, concretely recognizing that our release from sin's condemnation and release from its control is inextricably linked to Christ's own death to sin. Know this. But he then begins to use, he uses the word believe as well. He uses the word consider in verse 11, which by the way is an interesting word. It's kind of a, a, a deductive financial mathematical word. It means to reason. It means just to come to a logical conclusion. It means to calculate and see the truth. Now in the South where I grew up, we used reckon all the time. I don't know if I've heard reckon in Iowa that much, but we reckon was like normal vocabulary. Like I reckon I'm gonna go to the store is it time for work? I reckon. In other words, we would logically conclude, oh, if this is true and this is true, then I reckon I should do this or go here or do that. Paul here is saying, reckon is one of the words used in the translation, by the way. Here it's used consider. But he's saying logically come to this conclusion when you see all that Christ's death means. Don't run from the natural observation. So know something, believe it reckon it, consider it. And then he says, present. So here's the final verb used, verses 12, 13, and 14. You're to give, you're to offer. So do you see the escalation of verbs that all start with the word no? So I'm not at all saying there aren't several strategies to fighting sin. Yes, there are. We run from sin. We resist the devil. We take every thought captive. Amen, church? So there are multiple strategies to killing sin. I'm not saying those aren't valid or biblical, but I will say this. It all starts with knowing that every bit of your strategy, every bit of your, of your spiritual power is, is linked to and tied to and connected to Christ's own death to sin. And you will have no victory over it. You won't be able to be dead to it if you don't first and foremost know that he died to it. And you are in him. And so that's where you find your strength. That's where we find, I find our strength to live without sin's condemnation and free from its control. Now, a further word here about this concept of being united with Christ in his death. And that being what sources and feeds and empowers both our justification and sanctification or our past and present. One more thought about this. It concerns the word baptism. I personally don't believe Paul is thinking of the ordinance of water baptism here. In fact, I'll just confess to you, for probably 30 years as a preacher, a youth pastor, I've been in ministry since I was 19, I'm 56 now. So all those years, I've always seen this verse as a water baptism verse, but I've always in the back of my mind felt like, it doesn't seem to fit. And I was always afraid to voice it because I thought, well, I'm missing something probably. And this week I finally just, after just good reading and some studying, I just finally said, so 
What is this word baptism pointing to if it's not pointing to the ordinance of water baptism? I think it's pointing to the spiritual union that takes place at the moment of conversion when we are placed into Christ's own death by the Holy Spirit. And to show the incredible intensity of that union, Paul uses the word baptize, which means to immerse, to dip. So he's saying, understand, church, your justification and sanctification, your, your past and your present, the ability, the desire to live dead to sin is possible because you have been immersed, baptized, dipped, placed into Christ's own death spiritually. Now, that does not mean that I don't think water baptism is an immersive act a beautiful moment, and a sacred ordinance. I do. I believe the scripture teaches that baptism is after conversion by immersion. I'm just simply saying that this usage in this text, I don't think Paul is thinking about the, the 3,000 at Pentecost. Now, by the way, we can disagree on this. I found, a, oh, thank you, Keith. He just said, that's right. <laughs> he may be right, okay? I humbly acknowledge that I could be wrong on this, uh, I've read multiple people this week, both from the scholarly field as well as just from the practical devotional field. And there's good men and women on both sides of this. I tend to think, though, personally, no offense, Keith, he's here using the word to describe the, uh, inc the, the intense nature of our union with Christ. And so in some sense, we're kind of back to some thoughts in Ephesians, aren't we? That we are in Christ and it's a word, this word baptism, I think is used to make sure we understand something, that when we come to Christ and believe, we put our faith in what Christ did for us on the cross, it's a departure from the old life that should be seen like a death. In other words, we're not just leaving sin for a time. We're done with sin for good. Watch the phrasing. We are dead to sin. You see, it's a final funeral, not a temporary goodbye. Now, again, this is not saying that I don't think that water baptism is scriptural. It is. And I think the scriptural pattern, again, like I said, is immersion after conversion. In fact, we're doing this next week. Our Easter services, multiple people, multiple people getting baptized. And what are they showing? They're showing their death to sin, and they're showing, and, and even in their, in their physical posture, that they're uniting with Christ in his death to sin. So there is an identification to this concept in baptism. I just don't think that's what Paul was meaning here. I'd remind you that baptism is, is somewhat like a, like a public funeral. Do you know that? Of your old life. You're saying, because Christ died to sin, I'm uniting with him. So every time you revert back to old patterns of sin, notice the phrasing here. Every time you embrace old habits, when you insist on persisting in continuing sin, you're digging up an old body. You're pulling up a corpse. Because the Bible says we have died to sin. Let me pause here and ask you a question. Have you held your public funeral for your old life? Have you been baptized? Now, in this text, I think he's speaking of conversion. So let me just ask you, have you trusted Christ and believe that only his death can justify you and sanctify you? But let's say he does have in mind here water baptism, the ordinance. Have you been baptized? So I'm asking you this question again this week. Have you trusted Christ in salvation and have you obeyed him in baptism? Well, it's not too late to plan the public funeral for your old life. We're doing it next week. And if you want to get baptized next week and show others that you have trusted Christ, man, you can see our folks at Connect Center. You can see us after the service here. Our elders and prayer team will be here. You can drop me a note, send a text. You can email us multiple communication avenues. We'll take some time to sit down this week, 
Make sure that, that you have a, a testimony that is in line with the gospel. And man, we'd love to baptize you next week. We'll even baptize you at 645 if that's the service you're coming to. Here's what I'm saying. This is what it means to be dead to sin. To personally and publicly acknowledge that I am free from sin's condemnation and I am free from sin's control. It does not guilt me and it cannot guide me because I have died to sin just as Christ died to sin. And how? Because I have died to sin in Christ. So why does this matter? We've seen really what it means textually. Why does this matter? Because this shows us where our old life ended and where our new life begins. In three words, at the cross. This is where true life begins and old life ends. The moment we die to sin. And we don't die to sin until we're united, baptized, immersed into Christ's own death to sin. When that occurs, the old is gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So this is why this matters. So precious flock, let this text flood you like a tidal wave. When you believed, you were united in his physical crucifixion through a spiritual baptism. And just as sin's penalty and power was killed by Christ and through Christ and for Christ on the cross, so its penalty and power is nullified for you because of the cross. This is tremendously great news. Sin is no longer your master. Now, admittedly, our experience says something different, doesn't it? We know sin still exists. Unfortunately, that is true. But mark this down. It no longer rules. It no longer condemns. Yes, it tempts, it lures, it traps, and at times it trips us. We stumble. But it cannot any longer keep us down for the count, nor can it conquer us forever. It is, for those who are in Christ, only a temporary crippling not an eternal condemnation because you have been baptized into Christ's death. You see, before you came to Christ and were crucified with him, Galatians 2.20, you couldn't say no to sin. It was your dreadful owner, but now you can. Before you couldn't resist, now you do. Before you couldn't stop the wall of judgment crashing down on you, the hell of torment that was rushing towards you. You had no defense at all. But now in Christ, you have an eternal Savior, a steadfast refuge, a sure victor, a conquering lamb, and a roaring lion. You have a Jesus, and because of Christ, you can say no to Satan, both his condemnation and his control. You will not suffer its sting called death. You will not know its coffin of doom. Christ has taken the sting. He suffered the hell, endured the cross, and he's conquered the tomb. And if you're in Christ, then you have as well. You entered into his death spiritually. And now, through that identification, you are dead to sin. Say it, church, with me. Dead to sin, both its penalty and its power. This is is why it matters. Because it's the dividing line of our life. That's what the cross does. It separates us before Christ and after Christ. In a sentence, we'd say it like this. In union with his death then, I can live as dead to sin now. And do you see the tethering to the cross? Do you see how both ends of our life past and present are connected to everything Christ did. And if we lose that, we lose justification and sanctification. We have to have a, have a, a, a constant link to Christ's work for us. So church, will you say this with me? 
in union with his death to sin then, I can live as dead to sin now. This is what the cross provides for God's people. And really for anyone who believes, freedom from being dead in sins. Remember Ephesians 2? That was your life before Christ. You were dead in sins. But the moment you believed, were converted, regenerated, you saw the cross and you trusted, you repented and believed, you became dead to sin. Without a doubt, the cross of Christ is the dividing line for every believer between what we were and what we are. And living as a person dead to sin means living with a constant connection to the cross of Christ. That's where Jesus buried sin once and for all, and through him, all of his followers do as well. As John Stott illustrates, he says the cross separates the two volumes of the biography of your life. He uses John Jones as the imaginary believer. And he says, and I quote, Volume 1 ended with the judicial death of his former self. Volume 2 opened with his resurrection. And John Jones must remember these facts about himself. He has to keep reminding himself, Volume 1 is long since closed. I am now living in Volume 2. And it is inconceivable that I should reopen Volume 1 as if my death and resurrection with Christ had never taken place. You are dead to sin because Christ died to sin. And Christ's death on the cross and our union with it most assuredly answers the question asked in verse 1. Look at it. Put your eyes in the book one more time. What's the question? Shall we continue in sin? Ah, we've seen this morning why the answer is, may it never be because of the cross of Christ. Let's pray together, church. Four words are ringing in my ears right now. Hallelujah for the cross. How about yours? All of my past, all of my present, and to be frank, we can see in other parts of Scripture, every bit of my future, it's wrapped up in Christ's work on the cross. And we'll see next week, it's wrapped up in the resurrection too. But we're focusing this week on the concept of being dead to sin and that's inextricably tethered to Christ's own death to sin. And so I repeat and urge you, let this truth flood you like a tidal wave. And you say to Satan, you can't condemn me and you don't control me. But it's not because of anything you are or I am. It's because of everything Christ is.